this is one of these areas that is quite the roller coaster journey for individuals. And so hopefully we can give you kind of a very surface level understanding of dementia. And as Balfour continues to do these, um, please continue to join us for every single month as we dig deeper and deeper into um, this category of dementia. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in and get started in the next slide. Um, so to give you kind of an overall understanding of what dementia is, is it's basically dementia is this um, overall kind of an umbrella term. It's a group of thinking and social symptoms that interferes with daily functioning. And it's not a normal um, aspect of aging. It, it's a, dementia is a, a specific, it's not a specific disease. It's, it's a group of conditions that impairs what we do on a daily function when two different brain functions like uh, such as memory loss and judgment start to become impaired. And that's where we start to um, see challenges. People can actually mask their symptoms uh, for a lot of years. They, they themselves start learning um, that there's probably problems and they excuse it away. And because we're all busy with our own daily lives and we say, oh yeah, I know I've had such a busy day. We kind of start helping them excuse it away. And so it becomes somewhat challenging to, it's years later actually before um, we even start to recognize that maybe something's a problem because mom or dad get in a car and they end up in Nebraska or um, you know the house gets caught on fire or we recognize the bills aren't getting paid and then, oh my gosh, suddenly we're in crisis. And so they can actually mask it for a few years and we start looking back and we say, oh my goodness, you know, now I can recognize where I could start connecting the dots. Next slide. Um, so what we hear is it, technically there are seven stages of dementia, but in order to make it easy uh, for families to understand, uh, we really categorize those in early, middle, and late stages. So I kind of broke this down to show you that stages one, two, and three would end up in early stage. Stages three and four would end up in a middle stage, and then stages six and seven are in late. People who are really in stages one, two, and three, this is where they learn to mask their symptoms. Um, and this is where they can still um, drive. They still live pretty independently. They pay their bills. Um, it's when they start getting into, um, I'm sorry, stage four and five actually should be middle stage. It's a typo area. Uh, stages four and five are the middle stages. That's when we recognize um, somebody ended up in Nebraska or um, they've lost the keys or the bills aren't getting paid. And this is where it starts becoming problematic is the middle stage. Late stages is typically when we see somebody on hospice, end of life, they're falling more. Um, that's, that's what we typically see there. Next slide. There are five domains that become affected with um, dementia. And so this is where we see the cognitively, they start becoming impaired. We see them maybe be, this is, they ask a lot of the same questions. Like, when is dinner gonna be ready? Five minutes later, when is dinner gonna be ready? When is dinner gonna be ready? Or when is our son coming over? When is our son coming over? When is our son coming over? And as I've worked with families, a lot of times I'll hear them say, you know, he's just doing that to drive me crazy. No, no, he's not. This is really one of the domains that get affected. Um, functioning, they don't function the same way. Um, maybe they can't um, get up and walk across the room at the same speed that they once did. Um, physically, they can't get up and out of the chair um, they have to, um, physically, they can't uh, do the same mobility. Um, behaviors, we'll talk a little bit more about behaviors, um, but we start seeing behaviors happen. Um, sundowning is termed with Alzheimer's mostly. And where that term comes from is that in the morning time, you'll see light is a lot more steady in the morning. It's more consistent in the morning. In the afternoon, sundowning can actually start as early as noon or 2 to 2 p.m. It can actually go as late as 9, 10, 11 p.m. Typically though, your, your key hours are about 3 to 6 p.m. when sundowning happens. And if you notice the light, there's a lot more shadows. So people can become more fearful of the shadows. 
um, in assisted livings, nursing homes, rehabs, even hospitals, that's when shift changes happen. I know here in my building, we do a shift change at 2 p.m. That's typically when most communities do their shift changes is either at 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. So there's more noise. Um, children are coming home from school in the community roughly around 3 p.m. People are coming home from work anywhere between 4 p.m., 6 p.m. So their environment becomes a lot more chaotic. Um, and so they just have more stimulation. And so they become more agitated because there's a lot more happening around them and they don't know how to process that. Um, and then their relationships change. A lot of times you'll hear they call their spouse, um, either their sibling. Um, or they call their children their spouse. And so their relationships start to change because cognitively they don't know how to process that information any longer. Next. And then there become, there's eight cognitive losses as well. So their attention, they don't have the same attention span. They can't keep up in the conversation any longer. Um, and this is also where um, maybe family members start noticing changes too um, because they can't keep up in a conversation and they get very frustrated um, and so what they used to be able or they can't uh, watch a 30-minute television show and they can't they they become very frustrated as well um, so their attention span becomes shortened um, their perception of things I, I watch people where a lot of falls may happen in the home or also in communities is when you're transferring from carpet to tile or even carpet to wood floor, I see people try to step up or they try to step down and or they stutter step in those areas. And so their perception changes. Um, a lot of times when, especially in homes, if people are trying to exit seat, they're actually trying to go from inside to the outdoors. Um, I hear families want to put alarms on doors. Uh, what putting alarms on doors could do is actually trigger behaviors. And that causes uh, more problems than it does help. So I usually try to recommend putting a very big black um, carpet, black um, mat in front of the door, navy blue, dark brown, because their perception when they get to it is that might be a hole and they're gonna fall down it. And then they're more reluctant to cross it to get to the door to walk out. And then there's not bells going off everywhere either. So their perception does change. It's also why I'm reluctant to use white dishes because they serve black coffee in it. They don't tend to see that's black coffee. They just look at it and it looks like a hole. So that's what cha their perception changes. Um, their abstraction changes and that can cause big problems as does their reasoning. When you look inside the blue circle, their language changes. Um, as their certain dimensions progress, we call what's called word salad. So they're saying words, they think they're saying something, but to us, it just sounds very jumbled. And we're trying to figure out like a puzzle, what did they just say? Um, they speak in very short words. Um, and so we're trying to figure out again, what are they saying? They may use one or two words to get their point across and we still don't know what they're saying. Obviously their judgment changes and this is where I've seen stoves get left on. Um, I've seen keys go in a cereal box. I've seen things get flushed down toilets and that's obviously problematic. I've seen hearing aids get thrown away, um, valuable items get thrown away, um, organization skills are gone, and hence the way, reason bills don't get paid, and obviously their memory starts to deteriorate. Next. So like I mentioned before, dementia is this big umbrella term. Um, probably one of the most popular questions I've heard in my career from families is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And that can be very confusing for families. Um, it's, so the easiest way I've been able to explain this is that if someone were to um, say to you, do you have a dog? And you say, oh, I do. And the first thing they say then after that is they say, what kind of dog do you have? Because how many different breeds of dogs are there out there? Oh my goodness, I couldn't even count. And so then you say, oh, I have a poodle. 
Oh, I have a golden retriever. Oh, I have a golden lab. So this is somewhat very similar. And if you see the next line, there's actually 128 types of dementia. Seven of those are pediatric. So Alzheimer's is actually the most common form of dementia. And according to the Alzheimer's Association, it makes up for about 60 to 80% of dementia cases out there. So the difference is, is dementia is just your overarching uh, form, uh, you know, big umbrella, and then Alzheimer's is your very most common form underneath it. Much like if you said dogs is your most common thing, the most common dog out there, don't know, but let's just say it's the golden lab. Next. So when it comes to dementia, one of the very first thing I hear about from families who get very concerned is I hear, oh, they're having so many behaviors. And behaviors is actually a term that's just been negatively linked to dementia. If you were to get up and walk across the room, that's a behavior. If you were to pick up a coffee cup and drink it, that's actually a behavior. So for some reason throughout the years, the word behavior has now been negatively linked to individuals with dementia. Um, I've tried really hard to just find a different word for that. And really what they're having are just emotional expressions. And I, I really kind of feel that's just maybe a better term for this. So why and how do emotional expressions happen? And how do you avoid or control those emotional expressions? Next. So why do they happen? So what I can tell you throughout the years in what I've done in my career is this. What I've seen, um, and I, when I started working way back when I was 22, they didn't do dementia training. I started as a CNA in a nursing home on an Alzheimer's unit. Um, I got trained how to bathe, dress, um, shower, feed, evacuate, um, but I never got trained on how to actually work with people with dementia. And so what I can tell you is more often than not, we trigger the emotional expressions that people have because we communicate too fast or we communicate too much. Um, and the person actually uh, feels very frustrated and so they get agitated or they start to get very anxious. Um, I also see that we approach too fast um, sometimes and then they get startled. Um, we approach from behind and we startle them or we scare them and they react. Um, or the environment is way too overstimulating. I, I've walked into houses. Um, I've walked in even to in my own communities and I hear the TV's going, the radio's going, there's an activity going on, people are you know, visiting, and it's way too overstimulating for the individual. And all we need to do is just take them into a more quiet environment. Um, or there's a medical need. Maybe the person is in some pain, um, maybe they have back pain or knee pain from arthritis. And we have them on uh, as, as needed pain medication where what they really need is to be on a schedule of pain medication to control their pain. So a lot of what I believe what needs to happen is education and training. Um, and so over the years, I've developed um, a lot of trainings and a lot of education um, for my staff, uh, for families to simply say, if you're proactive and you learn how to communicate with the individual with dementia, and depending on the type of dementia and where they're at in their journey, different techniques will work in order to be proactive to minimize the emotional expressions. So there's different techniques you can use in order to head off the emotional expression and be proactive so that you don't end up with having to be reactive and then it becomes problematic. Next. So here's a lot of reasons why emotional expressions happen. You know, one can be due to an unmet need. They're trying to communicate what's going on. Maybe I'm hungry. Maybe I'm thirsty. Uh, maybe I'm too hot. Maybe I'm too cold. Maybe I'm really tired. Um, and so it can be just they're, they're pacing, um, something's going on, and they're just trying to communicate to you that I need something and I'm trying to get you to listen. 
Um, like I talked about, an overstimulating environment um, when too much is going on. Uh, the best thing, I, the way I've been able to explain stuff to people is as they go through the journey of dementia, um, if you've ever had a really bad migraine, a really bad headache, um, do you want to be in your car with a bunch of kids, teenagers, listening to very bad, loud, loud music in rush hour traffic? No, you do not. You would rather probably have your head in pillows in a very dark room where it's quiet. And so that's the best way I can explain it for the person with dementia. Their brain no longer has the ability to filter out all the additional noise and only focus on what they need to. Um, they've lost that ability. So the brain actually tries to process every noise or sound that it hears, and it just becomes really very overwhelming for the individual. Um, there's a lot of times when I've been asked by families when they move somebody in, um, is it okay for me to take the individual out to dinner? Obviously right now during COVID, we can't. Um, but pre-COVID, I used to say, sure, take them you know, out to dinner at four o'clock in the afternoon where the restaurant's very quiet and you can have a conversation. Please don't take them to Chili's on Friday night at 6 p.m. and don't ever take them to Texas Roadhouse ever, um, you know, because it's way too crowded. It's way too overstimulating for this individual. And that individual no longer knows how to express what's going on. Um, women just tend to get very emotional, start crying, they'll start fidgeting, and men just can tend to get very loud and obnoxious and they get very aggressive. Um, even an understimulating environment can cause challenges. Um, one of my colleagues and I, when we learned about this, uh, we actually did this experiment where everybody left the house one day, she and her house, me and mine, probably about eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, where all I did was sit on a couch. I went, I ate when I needed to, and I went to the bathroom when I needed to. But other than that, I didn't watch TV. I didn't read a book. I didn't do anything but sit on a couch, didn't play on my phone. It was probably one of the most boring days I've ever had, but when you're in an understimulating environment, by the time my husband got home, he told me I was really pretty grouchy because I'd had no human interaction all day. So even an understimulating environment can cause a reaction, not as much as an overstimulating environment, but definitely a reaction. As we talked about the physical environment can cause challenges. We talked about approach. We talked about a medical need. Um, how is a person being treated? One of the myths about uh, dementia is that people may not understand how they're being uh, talked to or um, approached or how they're being interacted with. I can assure you they do because people will go in and out of cognitively alert moments and they'll go in and out of cognitively confused moments. Earlier in the journey, they are more cognitively alert Later in the journey, they're more cognitively confused. But during those alert moments, they do know if they're being treated condescendingly or disrespectful, or if someone's not being truthful with them. They do know if they're being talked to behind their back. And that can be create a lot of Yeah. So, you know, if they feel like they're being disrespected or being spoken to condescendingly, that also will create an emotional expression. Um, the domino effect really happens more in uh, places like assisted living or communities. And what that means is as soon as one person starts to have an emotional expression, it's like watching a fuse being lit. And all of a sudden you don't have one person, you have three or four or five, and then it's a bigger problem for staff to try to control. So we don't want that happening either. And again, that goes back to being proactive and not reactive. Next. Some of the common challenges we'll see um, with emotional expressions is bathing and getting people to bathe. What we hear is, oh no, I've already bathed. I don't need to do that again. Um, yes, you do. And so we can get really creative, maybe bathing the top half of the body today and the bottom half of the body tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of different techniques we teach staff in memory care communities in order to accomplish the task we need to. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've served ice cream, chocolate chips, potato chips while we're trying to give a shower because then the person has something to focus on while we're trying to get the task done. And I can tell you, um, not that it works 100% of the time, but it does work. Um, dressing can always be a challenge. Uh, one of the best 
uh, techniques that we've tried is because um, so sometimes the person will put on the same dirty clothes day after day after day. So removing the, something. removing the dirty clothes at night where they can't put them on the next morning is a technique. Exactly. One of the more creative things we had to do was actually um, a lady I, I cared for one time had this yellow jumpsuit she loved to wear um, and her son just went out and made sure she had like 10 of them. So when we were trying to get her bathed, we would just pull it out, a clean one out and say, look, it's your favorite yellow jumpsuit. And she was sort of undressing herself because she didn't realize she had on a yellow jumpsuit and she would dress in the same outfit every day, but it was just, ten, we had 10 of them, um, just repetitive. And it was easier to get her undressed, cleaned up and dressed in the exact same outfit. So while it's a repeat and she's wearing the same thing, sometimes it's okay that she was just in clean clothes. There are a lot of bathroom challenges and um, that becomes really because they, if you think about this generation, the only time they were um, undressed was in front of their spouse or in front of their physician. So in their minds, we're strangers and this is not appropriate. And so they don't want to be in that vulnerable position. And so we have to gain a lot of trust with them and we have to um, do a lot of building up um, a relationship with them. And again, I've served a lot of ice cream, chocolate chip cookies, potato chips, um, just so that we can get the task done. And the reason why I do that is that when any human being is uh, feels like they're scared, um, they're overwhelmed, they're frustrated, they're upset, um, they're angry, um, in any one of us, our brain actually releases a chemical. And that chemical, from the time we're born to the time we die. And what that chemical does, it actually cr uh, craves um, something sweet, something salty, or something fatty. And so that's why if you think about what is your favorite comfort food, your favorite comfort food will actually land in one of those three categories. Not always, every once in a while, I come across somebody who's like, oh no, I, I crave salads. I'm like, do you? Okay. But then they'll say, I, with a lot of ranch dressing, I'm like, okay. Um, but any, every once in a while, I will come across somebody who wants something healthy. Um, but if you think about it, you, most people crave ice cream, chocolate, pasta, pizza, um, something that lands in that. So that's why I've found that um, ice cream, chocolate chip cookies, potato chips really work wonders when we're trying to complete a task. Um, we do have challenges with people eating as they travel through their dementia journey. They don't eat as much and we do see some weight loss. Um, but the, the very last thing that somebody with dementia can actually control is what they put in their mouth. And so that's kind of when we know they're kind of heading into that final late stage of dementia and we will get the support services of hospice involved uh, to ensure that we have every valuable resource available to us to ensure their quality of life up until they take their final breath. Um, so then we also see wandering and exit seeking, and those are two completely different things. There's actually um, purposeful wandering, non-purposeful wandering, and exit seeking. Uh, we see individuals do more purposeful wandering at home, and that's when they're actually uh, doing wandering in a pattern, and you'll find that they go to different items in the house and touch them they are actually self-soothing themselves um, because they can still connect to things that mean something to them or that they can identify. And I will tell families, don't interrupt them. They, that's their way of soothing their anxiety. It may drive you crazy, um, but that's self-soothing to them. Um, Non-purposeful wandering, uh, we'll see it, uh, people do that at home. Um, we see it more in communities, but that's them being uncomfortable. Um, they're not sure where they're at, they're anxious, and they'll do it in a jig-jagged pattern. And we do want to step in because that will only escalate. Exit seeking is truly, they are pounding on windows, they are pounding on doors, they're looking for a way out or to escape. And we also want to step in and find a way to soothe them and redirect them. Um, communicating, uh, I've already talked a little bit about that and why it's a challenge. Sleeping patterns, the last thing we ever want is for somebody to get their days and nights mixed up because the caregiver at home doesn't get the rest they need to care for somebody. Um, and here in the community, we're staffed 24-7, but most communities don't staff 
the same way in the eat overnight that they do during the day. So we still don't want their days and nights to get mixed up. They really do, like any of us, need to get very good sleep at night so that they can function during the day. Um, and so we wanna make sure that their sleeping patterns stay healthy. They will sleep more during the day. In, in the earlier stages, they really only need about a 30 minute, no more than an hour nap. In the middle stages, maybe an hour to an hour and a half, mid morning, mid afternoon. In the later stages, maybe an hour and a half to two hours, but they don't need to be sleeping all day long. They still need to be up. They still need to be active in order for them to sleep all night. And then, of course, with certain types of dementias, you will see hallucinations and delusions, and that can be very scary for them. Um, to them, it's very, very real. Um, if they're saying, I'm seeing little men, you want to say, okay, I, I think that's very real to you. Let's go and go into another room and let's get you away from them. As soon as you start saying, oh, no, they're not there, um, you've now gotten into an argument with them, and I can assure you, you will not win. Um, they're going to win and that's just going to escalate things. Just take them and get them away from what's ever scaring them and then try to de-escalate it that way. Or let's go and remember the chemical that's just been released in their brain. Let's get away from there and let's go see if we can't find a snack or let's go for a walk or let's go do this, but get them away from what's ever scaring them. Next. So what's the best way to deal with the behaviors that we see? Well, I'll tell you this, if you don't already know it, it takes a whole heck of a lot of patience. And I'm telling you, patience, 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 patience. Um, I tell families all the time, you know, anyone who can take care of somebody at home, um, kudos and God bless you because here in the building, uh, nobody in this building does it 24 seven. We, we staff this building with three different shifts and it takes all of us as a team to do it, you know? Um, so anyone who does this at home, thank you for what you do because this takes a lot, um, but it does take a lot of patience. It takes a lot of creativity. I tell my staff all the time, you know, uh, does plan A always work? No, that's why there's 26 letters in the alphabet. You go to plan B, you go to plan C, you go to plan D. And if you get to the Z, then just go back to plan A, A, B, B, C, C. You know, we're constantly, constantly trying to look for creativity. And if you kind of hit your brick wall and say, I just don't know what else to do, then call a friend, call someone else. That's why the Alzheimer's Association exists. And, and in a little bit, we'll make sure you get the 24 uh, seven um, line for the Alzheimer's Association. There are resources out there. You know, I always tell families, you're not in this by yourself. We work together as a team. As long as I've been doing this, if I get out on the floor and I'm trying to help, I even hit my brick wall and say, okay, I need to step away and I need someone else to come in because all my ideas are not working here. So someone else needs to come in because clearly there's something I have not thought about. Um, and I tell families, you know, you got to have a sense of humor. Um, I, when people ask me why I do what I do all the time since I've done it for so long, I usually, my response is because there's never a dull moment in memory care. So we have to keep our sense of humor when working with individuals with dementia um, because it is hard. This is one of the toughest things to do is take care of somebody um, that has a cognitive challenge. I usually say you have to be a detective. Something triggered the behavior, the emotional expression that didn't just happen. Um, somebody approached the wrong way. Somebody communicated too fast. Um, maybe they're in a, a pain. You know, sometimes it is actually the dementia. You know, while I'm not a fan of just throwing a pill at something, there is a time and place that medication is appropriate to help the person so that we can ensure quality of life. So being a detective and digging down as to what happened helps us better care for those individuals. Being able to redirect appropriately. Um, I always say, talk about the topic. I, I remember an individual who just insisted that it was snowing outside when it was 
um, I think the early spring, like in April or May, and the, they just insisted it was snowing. And really what it was, was the cotton trees outside were shedding their cotton and you could see cotton flying everywhere. So we weren't gonna win by saying, no, it's not snowing, it's cotton, nope, it's snowing. So we just started saying, well, what's the biggest snowstorm have you ever been in? Did you get in snowball fights? Did you build snowmen? Did you ever lay in the snow and build the snow angels? And we got into this great top conversation and reminiscing about um, how he grew up in Minnesota and there was always snow there and big snow drifts and everything. So we just talked about the topic and was able to redirect and finally get to having some hot chocolate and cookies, although none of us wanted to drink hot chocolate. It was very warm that day. But anyway, we redirected the conversation and it was fine. Um, provide space. If the person is really that agitated, um, back off. You know, I, I will tell my staff here, it's, there's no reason for you to try to get involved and then you get hit or you get hurt. You know, if they, if they you know, break something, we can repair it. If they want to just pace and walk around, as long as they stay safe and we keep everybody else safe, just give them a little bit of space and be able to let them calm down and let them breathe a little bit um, because we don't want to interact with someone that, that's that angry. And then we talk about being person-centered approach. Make sure we're focusing on them to provide the care. Don't be task oriented, you know, don't say I've got this and this and this to do because we're going to miss something and we can actually trigger the emotional expression and we don't want to do that. Next, having the right communication strategies. Um, like I said, this can also trigger the emotional expression and we don't want to do that. So slow down, keep it very simple, use short sentences, um, sometimes pictures will help depending on the type of dementia they have, um, depending on where they're at in their journey. I've used pictures um, for, you know, a bathroom and people understand that. Um, I've used pictures like if you want to go outside, um, food, you know, stuff that you'll use frequently. If you're going to use these frequently, have them laminated because you, you'll be pointing to them, you'll be flipping through them, put them hole punch and put them on a ring um, because it helps better to just point at something and they can say yes or no. Um, even if you have their favorite foods, ice cream, cookie, um, chicken, uh, beef, um, green beans, you know, you, there's a lot of things you can use like when you're wanting uh, strawberries, blueberries, those kind of things, um, but laminate them and because they'll get sticky and they'll see things will get spilled on them and it's a lot easier uh, to use the pictures and have like, make them colorful or there's another activity for you to do, print black and white ones, color them the way they want them colored, then laminate them. If you have grandkids, let the grandkids do an activity with the grandparents, then have them laminated. There's so much you can do with pictures in order to communicate um, with the individual. I always tell people you, you're working with an individual um, who as we age, we all sustain hearing loss. So I tell my staff, please don't start shouting at them. This is not helpful. Um, you're just creating more noise. So you want to lower your voice and talk slightly louder, like you hear a DJ on the radio. Um, I, I would love to record my husband. He has this amazing, like a voice you would hear of a DJ on the radio. Um, but then he knows I use him as an example in my trainings and he doesn't like me using him as an example. Um, the other reason I look at is because with certain types of dementia, it does affect the temporal lobe. And so I've listened to families say, oh, I bought these expensive hearing aids and they don't do a trick. Okay, well then that tells me it's the temporal lobe that's damaged and I don't care what the hearing aids cost, they're never gonna fix the problem. So that's where I really try to say, well then start using pictures as your communication tool because you're never gonna communicate verbally. That's that's part of the challenge where they're getting frustrated and you're getting frustrated too. So if you, if you lower your voice and start talking a little louder, that might be more successful. If that's still not successful, then go to pictures or go to, you have letters you can point out and a dry erase board that just takes a little bit longer to do it, but still can be successful. Um, you might use gestures with your hands and I'm always accused of talking with my hands. And if I sat on them, I wouldn't be able to talk, but, like, come with me. 
stop. Um, let's go this way. You know, simple things like that, they might understand. Or I'll say, can you get up? Can you come with me? Can you sit down? And a lot of times people will understand that. Be very mindful of your facial expressions. Um, what I mean by that is sometimes I see staff saying, good morning, Mr. Jones. I'm like, does he think you're having a good morning? Because you don't look like you're having a good morning. And people with dementia will read your facial expressions and your body language, sometimes even your tone of voice, long before they'll ever listen to what you're actually saying. So keep a smile on your face, keep your voice um, you know, lifted, and be careful of those things because that can actually uh, cause problems when you're trying to communicate with individuals with dementia. Next. So what does help and support look like? Um, so for the person with dementia, this is kind of some things that I don't ever hear talked about. Um, but the first and foremost thing, even before you get a diagnosis of dementia or you're in the very early stages of it, is keeping the brain active and healthy is the very first step. So a lot of times people hear me say exercise in the brain. And that's kind of a funny term. And people go, well, how do you do that? Um, and what I get asked a lot um, is, is this. Well, I do crossword puzzles. Is that exercising my brain? Or I do Sudoku, or I'm learning a new language. So is that what you mean? Kind of. Um, so if I were to ask you this, I love this time of year because I can't tell you how many people probably their New Year's resolution is, I'm going to get healthier, so I'm going to join a gym. Um, so if you were to join a gym and you walked in the gym every day, but the only thing you did when you walked in the gym was you worked your biceps and you walked out, is that worth your gym membership? Probably not. Um, are you getting a full body workout? Nope, you're not. Your biceps might become stronger, but your abs, your legs, your back is doing nothing for those. So that's kind of the same analogy. If as you're exercising your brain, the only thing you're doing is crossword puzzles, you're exercising one part of your brain, but you're not exercising the rest of it. If all you're doing is learning a new language, you're exercising one part of your brain, but you're not doing anything for the rest of it. So great for that part of your brain, but you're not doing anything for the rest. So it's kind of like when you join the gym membership, you want to do biceps one day, you want to do abs the next day, you want to do legs the next day, then maybe in a full week, you've done a full body workout. So that's what I would tell you for when you're exercising your brain. Maybe one day you want to learn a new language. Maybe the next day you want to do a crossword puzzle. Maybe the next day you want to do listening to music. One of those things, but you want to do parts. And the harder part is, is what all the things you can do to exercise the full part of the brain. That is really kind of the bigger challenge. And because it's not, can you Google that? No, there's not really a lot of great information out there. Um, and so I've really kind of studied hard to learn all different parts. And we set up our calendar, our activity calendar here from Sunday through Saturday, we really try to set up our activities here where we can ensure we're exercising every single part of the brain for our residents um, through a seven day period of time. So one of the things I can give you a couple of suggestions um, is music therapy is probably one of the best things you can do. And here's how I can tell you how to cheat. Um, so if you are reading the words, like the lyrics to a song and you have to be singing out loud, and you have to be moving a body part. So like you're waving your arms or you're moving your feet. Um, that is actually the only exercise that will exercise every single part of your brain. And it forces the left and the right brain to communicate with each other. If you did that for 15 minutes, three times a week, that is the best thing you can do for your brain overall. Um, Cognitive, um, learning a new uh, language, art therapy, putting puzzles together, um, painting, any kind of painting. So those 
I don't even know if they're doing this anymore. Do like the wine sip and go paint. The, there's things all over the place. Those were great therapies. Um, now you can get apps on your phone where you can paint by numbers. Uh, that is great therapy for your brain. So those are really great things to be doing to help exercise your brain. Um, one of the other things is the Mediterranean diet is one of the healthiest diets you can be on. It's, it's uh, great for your body overall, but it's one of the best things you can do for your brain. Um, any heart healthy diet is good one for your heart, but it's also good for your brain. And anything that keeps oxygenated uh, blood flowing to the brain. One of the best things you can do is running. Um, I don't run. I always say my run for the day is from my warm bed to my warm shower. So I'm not a runner. Um, and for those of you who are not, walking is the next best thing. So again, 15 to 20 minutes of uh, walking three to four times a week also oxygenates the blood and gets it moving to the brain. But you can do uh, chair exercises. There's a lot of things you can do from chair um, exercises, chair yoga. There's actually um, silver sneakers out there where you can walk the mall. Um, there are, uh, I know there's a Zumba for seniors. I don't remember what it's called. I, I don't remember what they do for seniors, what it's called, but specifically to seniors for Zumba. Um, so anything though that will get oxygenated blood flowing to the brain helps also. So there's actually a study out of Finland called the Finger Study that studied over 2000 participants that actually did these exact things. And they were able to show that it delayed the progression of dementia without the use of medication. So it's a scientific study that studied that exactly focused on these things. Next. So what does help and support look like? Here's the Alzheimer's Association, the 24 seven helpline. Um, so if you need outside resources, this would be the first thing I would tell you to call. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has really done well in the last several years where they don't just focus on Alzheimer's a disease as a dementia. They have other resources out there that you, they can give you in regards to vascular, Lewy bodies, uh, frontal temporal, other dementias uh, that they can access and give information on those too. Balfour has now started a support group on Tuesday evenings with uh, our own Judy Gold and Laura Panizzi. Um, and so you can join that at 5.30, just send them information. Laura, do you wanna talk about it just real quick? Yeah, if I could uh, unmute me, sure. Yeah, the support group runs every Tuesday, 5.30 to whatever time the families need us. You don't need to be part of Balfour. Everybody can participate. The only thing, just send me the information with your email. And every Tuesday, we will send the Zoom invite to whoever wants to participate. It's okay. extremely informal. It's just to share the challenges, everyday challenges, and share with each other possible solutions. Thank you. Um, make sure you have your own personal network. Like I said, nobody in our buildings does this alone. Um, I would never expect a caregiver to do this alone. Make sure you have friends, family, professional resources that you can call on for help and support, somebody to talk to. Um, make sure you're taking care of you, whatever that looks like. Um, naps, massages, bubble baths, going for a walk. Um, I always try to use this analogy that if you were a pitcher and the water inside that pitcher is your energy, and all the glasses around that are all your responsibilities and you keep pouring all your energy into those responsibilities, at some point you're gonna deplete your energy. And if you don't take time for yourself to replenish that fluid, you're going to bottom out. And then what? Then you're not going to be good for the people who truly need you. So you have permission to take care of you because that's very important for you to be able um, to replenish your energy and take care of you. Next. So respite care, a lot of times people say, what is respite care? I don't understand what that is. Basically what respite care is, is it provides short-term relief for the primary caregiver. And the time frame can, de can vary depending on the need of the caregiver. I've seen caregivers say, you know, if I could just have two weeks a year back to back, that'd be great. Other caregivers, they need three hours 
once a week, you know, other caregivers, they need, um, you know, a week, once a quarter. So it really depends on each individual person and nobody can define that but you. It can be provided in the private home. Some people need a hire a home uh, care to come into the home to provide that. Some families choose a day program. And we are hoping here at Cherrywood with the vaccines now to be, be able to open our day program here in the next few weeks. Um, we're working with the both state and county on that. Um, or it can be provided in assisted livings where families can have their loved ones come and stay for a week, up to anywhere from a week to a few weeks to provide the respite care that the uh, pr primary caregiver needs. Costs will vary just depending on how long and where the care is provided. And the pri I, again, will encourage private caregivers to take advantage of this. need a break. Look at your own private situation and determine what does this mean you being, uh, what I need to be to take care of the person with dementia. Next. So thank you all very much for attending. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, hi, I'm Lynn Loftus. Just wondering at what point do they understand that things are changing, that they probably have dementia? Um, usually, and it varies with every single person, um, a lot of times what I've seen is a person starts noticing themselves before the people around them do. They'll notice that um, they didn't know where the car keys were um, and they can't find them and they start scratching their head. They notice they can't keep up in a conversation. They notice that they may not be able to keep up at work and they start getting nervous. They start getting worried. Um, dementia is actually the second most feared diagnosis in the world. Uh, cancer is the most feared diagnosis, any form of cancer. And so people don't tend to say things to their loved ones because of the fear of, I don't want to end up with a person. I don't want to end up in a nursing home. I don't want to end up in assisted living. I don't want to be a burden to anyone. So they start band-aiding things together. They'll leave sticky notes everywhere. They try to compensate for things. And so they just don't say anything to anybody. And so it can go on for several weeks or months or even a couple of years before all of a sudden the people around them go, you know, what's wrong? You've asked that question three times and they'll go, have I? Oh, I've just had a long day. You know, I'm just having one of those moments. And we go, oh, I know I've had a long day too. And we let it go or we help excuse it away. So a lot of times they notice it long before those of us around them notice it. And it varies with every single person and it varies depending on the type of dementia. Does that, does that answer the question, Lynn? It does. My, my mom's over at Lavender Farms right now and um, it, you know, it's so hard because I don't think she really thinks there's anything wrong. Um, some, my guess is she might, but she's not gonna tell you because she doesn't want you to put her behind locked doors. And that's, that's a scary thing. People don't want to lose their independence. People don't want to lose their freedoms. Um, so sometimes they'll say, no, there's nothing wrong. Um, my, and I have, my dad just turned 91, my mom's 86. So as much as I do this professionally, I do this as a daughter. Um, and I've been down this road with both of my parents um, too. And so I've heard them say, I don't have memory problems. Mm, okay, but you've repeated the same question three times in the last half hour. Okay, you know, so they'll excuse it away too because there's that fear of what if I am and now where are you going to put me? And so it's a very gentle conversation. And that's where I tell families lean on the professionals. And I've, I've told more than one family, let me be the bad guy. I'm okay with being the bad guy and stepping in and saying, you know, I've noticed that, you know, you, you repeated this question. Um, did I not explain myself very good? So why, why is that? And they'll go, oh, did I repeat the same question? Mm -hmm. I'm just having a bad day. Okay. 
you've had several bad days. Why is that? And they can be mad at me all they want. And then that removes you, Lynn, is that you can still be the daughter and you can be the good guy. I can be the bad guy all I want to, and they can be mad at me. So sometimes that conversation is easier. So you can still be the good person. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's different now. So I'm learning along with her. Mm -hmm. So thank and you. It's okay. It's okay for you to be learning. This is a whole, I, I used to say this is the most exhausting, uh, emotionally, mentally, physically exhausting roller coaster someone could be on. And I actually had a family member say it's an entire amusement park because sometimes the ride's fun. Sometimes the ride is scary. Sometimes the ride uh, makes me sick. Sometimes I don't want to get on the ride at all. So on any given day, on any given moment, it can be a different experience. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Do you have any tips with was at the Balfour and had moderate dementia, which has since gone pretty, um, it's progressed to the point where now she's like, wow, I, I'm having trouble remembering and it's so confusing. Um, I have dementia as well from multiple brain injuries. So I tend to be the family interpreter on her behalf. Um, but so we hear a lot of, I can't eat, I can't, I can't force myself to eat. It makes me sick. Everything tastes horrible. And I, you know, I understand that, um, you know, you lose your taste and the only thing that tastes good is sugar, but she has diabetes. So, um, you know, she's 83, so I'm like, let her eat what she wants, but you know, any food tips? So as we all age, actually, the last taste bud to go is the sweet taste bud. So right. that's why people, I was aware to, of that. yeah, that's why we all tend to gravitate toward the sweets. Um, typically what we try, and that's why people tend to pour on the salt too, is because they can't taste everything. If you ever think about being sick with a cold or the flu, everything just tastes bland. So nothing tastes good. Um, well, I know, I, I know completely I have the same thing, but I don't know how to help her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So making things colorful helps. If she's 83 years old, I used to tell my mom when my grandmother, I'm like, at this age, how much does the diabetes matter? Let her enjoy what she wants to enjoy. Um, so That's I tend to say, yeah, I say, you know, what were um, the things she used to enjoy? You know, um, what were her favorite foods? Was it a burger and fries? Was it, um, you know, chicken and potatoes? Um, what were the things that she used to enjoy? And then instead of maybe three meals a day, maybe it becomes six smaller meals a day where she's snacking during the day more than really truly sitting down for a meal. Um, maybe instead of trying to, some of it could be, she no longer understands how to use utensils either. Uh, we find as people travel through the dementia journey, um, it's easier for them to use finger foods like chicken nuggets or smaller cut up things um, more than trying to use a fork and a knife. Uh, I will tell you, there is a thing called the red plate study. People will, what the study says is they'll consume more from a red plate than they will from something that's white because they can see the contrast of the food better. Like corn will show up more on a red plate. Like if you think of the color of mashed potatoes on a white plate, there's not a strong contrast, but there is okay. from a red plate. Mm -hmm. And so the contrast of it, people actually, if you think all of us, um, people eat with their eyes before they eat with their taste buds. So if it looks appetizing, we'll consume it. And it more so than if we, you know, we just taste it. So little things like that, um, it has to be really strong in flavor too. Um, because like I said, our taste buds tend to win over it. And if she consumes a little bit more ice cream, you know, and there are diabetic things out there. I get doctors and we don't ever know how long we're going to live. So we don't want her diabetes or sugar to go out of control, but there are diabetic desserts out there that will stay within um, what her doctor recommends and her doctor might be able to recommend some things as well. Okay. Thank keep you. it simple for her very much. Keep it simple. And it truly, I would guess, um, 
maybe six small meals instead of three meals might be more helpful for her. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a second question if nobody has a second question. Um, she tends to um, hoard. And so um, she's in a facility, they bring her food. And so she stores all the plastic utensils and plastic napkins and plastic plates. And I understand she's trying to, that's her last little way to be, have control. Um, but it upsets our family members because they have to go in and clean that out every week. Um, any solutions or that's just what it is? Um, sometimes that's just what it is. Um, and I would say be thankful that it's plasticware and not food. <laughs> um, because yes. I've seen people hoard food um, and then that attracts little critters and that's never fun. She's doing that. And of course the food is at, is ending up in, in like dresser drawers and closets and mm -hmm. places it shouldn't. Yeah, yeah that, that's part of, um, it, Part of the generation know that. I mean, some of these individuals grew up in the depression. Um, yeah. And so that's part of just the generation and growing up um, in the depression. I mean, that is what it is. I used to have a little lady cause she grew up in the depression. Oh my gosh, the things that she would take back to her room and it just was what it was. And so every time she'd go to an activity that's when housekeeping got in there and just cleaned things out. Some people want okay, to watch yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But I would That's say, gonna, yeah, it's some of it is that was what they were like lifelong. We're not going to change that. Some of it right. is we would, we would um, take stuff in and clean out the bad stuff. And so some of it is you're not going to change your behavior that's lifelong. You're just not going to. Some of it is, is in not knowing what the complete situation is, is some of it is um, a security for them that they feel they're gonna control whatever that they can control. If they've lost a lot of their independence, um, they don't get to choose what they're gonna eat. They don't get to choose when they get to wake up. They don't get to choose you know, when they're gonna do this. They're gonna try to control whatever that they can control. And so that's what now she has with this can control and it's not, you know, a risk to anybody, then it's somewhat minor. If it's a I risk, agree. like the food and mold, and she's going to, if food is getting moldy or food is getting, and there's a risk that that's to her health, she's going to eat something moldy or there's critters that's going to come in. That's a completely different thing that needs to have something that needs to be taken care of very quickly. But if it's, she's just collecting napkins and plastic wear and it's not hurting anything and that's what she can control and makes her anxiety stay in check then that I would say, don't, don't really mess with it. Just let her have her control, go in and clean out what you need to and let that be, let, let it be what it is. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope everybody's going, is, is enjoying the beautiful lunch that our chef at Cherrywood cook. And uh, as Kathy said, we have the support group where we can discuss in more details, a lot of other things. Soon enough, Kathy will join us uh, a couple of days in the support group too. If you want to participate, send us an email. And it's already one o'clock. Miss Kathy, do, would you like to close with anything? Um, as you can see, my information is right here on the screen. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm more than happy to answer questions or follow up with you on an individual basis. Um, as I told you, I know um, I've walked this journey with so many families, and so I know how challenging it can be. And a lot of times we finish a presentation like this, and the next day a family just says, oh my gosh, I have another question please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to help and support where I can. Thank you all so much for attending and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Bye. Nice job, Kathy and team. Thank you all so very much. You did great. Bye, Thank Brandy. You. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much. I want to be a part of the support group, Laura. <laughs> hey, send me your email. Oh, I think I got your email. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone. Nice job.
Nice job, Kathy. Thank you.